Hey everybody, welcome back. This is our last, last lesson of this quarter. My goodness. Thank you for hanging out with us this been quarter. A journey. It has been a journey, we've gone a true all over the journey. Ancient world. Yeah, along with Paul, we've been all over the place. It's been pretty awesome. And uh, your journey partners this quarter have been, I'm Becky Zardi, I'm the Director of Ministry with Women from the Ministry Council of the Cumberland mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church. My name is Chris Fleming. I am the Adult <laughs> Ministries Coordinator for the Ministry Council of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and welcome. Yeah, welcome. We have journeyed along. It has been a fantastic time. Really excited about next quarter. Um, really going to hear some different voices next quarter with continuing on with the missions idea. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Hope you will join us for that as well. Yes. Today, our scripture selection comes from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Our memory verse is Acts 19.2. It says, he, Paul, said to them, do you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Hmm. Sounds a lot like a, a lot of Protestant churches. Yeah. Mm, okay. Now we're getting into some weeds. Let's have our prayer for illumination before we jump even further in. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when you give us disciples to mentor, help us to give them the full picture. Help us find time to share our Christian faith with others. Send your Holy Spirit to dwell in our midst, to convict us, to teach us truth, and to give us words when we stand in front of others as your witnesses, to share that you are the one true God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen and amen. 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 Yeah. So we're still hanging out with Paul. It's been this awesome time of calling the Holy Spirit and the Hall of Tyrannus. And Bob really starts us, it's Reverend Dr. Bob Watkins wrote this lesson, and he really starts us with this whole geography, this whole context of some scholars estimate that Paul traveled more than 10,000 miles. That is a lot of walking people. Well, I guess in some boats. In but, some boats. It's a long journey. Yeah, it is a very long journey. 10,000 miles that he went through Israel, Greece, Syria, Turkey, and Italy. That's a lot of places to be and to share the gospel. More than message. I've been to. Okay. Well, very good. So, and Bob really gets into where he's been as well. He's been to preach in Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, Canada, Laos, Cambodia, China, Japan, South Korea, Mongolia, and a host of other countries. Just a couple places. Yeah, just a couple places. So where have you, have you preached anywhere outside the United States? No. Nope. Me either. We need to work on that. We do need to work on that. Maybe yeah. maybe we haven't been called to the missionary. I have not been called to be a missionary. And I've never felt that uh, only in the sense of foreign missions. Sure. I mean, I feel like I'm a missionary in the sense that I'm an apostle and mm -hmm. sin and all that does mm -hmm. as we study. But I, I don't, and I still don't. Like, as of yet, I have not felt yeah. any inkling that God has wanted me to open the doors. Go outside. To, yeah. Outside your culture and outside. And I say this. You're not less of a Christian because of that. No, no, right. no, absolutely not. Some people think because they don't like get up and move and and all that, then they're not fulfilling God's will. It's just not true. I mean, mm -mm. people need to be pastors and teachers and Sunday school mm -hmm. teachers. And then some people need to get up and go. Yeah. So if you have a feeling that you're supposed to be doing God's will and you're um, struggling with it, mm -hmm. pack your bags, you sinner, and go right. do what God says. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. if you don't, you don't. Yeah. And in all honesty, if you really feel like God is calling you to the mission field, to the foreign mission field, please contact Reverend Dr. Milton Ortiz and schedule a time to, to have a conversation with him about what you're feeling and why you're feeling that. Yeah. 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 That's what we're here for. Absolutely. It's very, very important to have an open, honest dialogue about that. And that's what really Bob's talking about in this introduction is he's talking about, like Paul, he was sent and he went to all these different places and how he really talks about his call and what he felt and, and where that was. So, um, the it, exact opposite of fun and exciting is a synod meeting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's where he was. And he really didn't want to be at the synod meeting. Um, but this is where he felt the call. This is where at least the beginnings, the yeah. inklings of, of the mm -hmm. yearning came. And it was uh, Buddy Stott, Reverend Buddy Stott, which I'm assuming is the Stott of Stott Wallace. Yeah, that is correct. Um, Buddy and Beverly Stott. I didn't, you know, sadly, I don't know the, the histories of those that much. But um, but anyway, um, I like the way uh, Dr. Bob 
talks about this, you know, um, sometimes you think great people have to be this dynamic, gregarious, sure. you know, jumping behind yeah. the pulpit, stirring people up um, in order to be effective. I've known from my personal life that's not true, but uh, but faithfulness mm-hmm. and being faithful and authentic to who you are. Mm-hmm. Because it's not really up to us. It's up to God. Yeah. So it wasn't Buddy Stott or everybody thought that was convincing Bob right. to do the work. It was God revealing God's plan to Bob. Yeah. And so this was... Through the, Buddy. Buddy was faithful. Yeah. Um, I get it. I've been in Presbyterian meetings trying to get back to a Vanderbilt game. <laughs> I know exactly what Bob's talking about here. Like during the spring, it's, it's usually a... Uh, you know, something springs, but a baseball game, or what is it, March, April. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if Vanderbilt's doing well, they're in the NCAA tournament, and, well, that hasn't happened in about right. seven years. I don't worry right. about that. Right. But the fall one, there's always a football game. It's just, I think I think Covenant Presbytery decides, oh, Vanderbilt's playing at home on this day in September. Let's have a meeting there. And right. let's put it so far away that Chris can't possibly go to his football Right, because they're all thinking about me. me. It's all about me. Yeah, oh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do appreciate that, though. He brought that up about Buddy not being yeah. terribly compelling. Just a quick personal story. Uh, I took my daughter to a Joyce Meyer conference. And my daughter was 17 at the time, 16, 17, something like that. And they had all these dynamic speakers. Of course, Joyce Meyer was there. I think Beth Moore, uh, Joel Olstein, just very dynamic personalities behind the pulpit. And when we were um, driving home, I asked her who – who did she appreciate the most and why? And it was actually, um, Billy Graham's daughter, Ruth. Um, she was like buddy, just very unassuming, very quiet, um, not a dynamic in your face, ah, personality, but the message that she shared was so authentic and so real, um, that it absolutely touched my daughter very much. And so I think about that a lot, that it's not, it's not necessarily the dy- dynamism of the of the speaker. individual of the speaker. It's the Holy Spirit speaking. It's the dynamism to you. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The other thing that, again, we've had glimpses of it uh, in this uh, quarter with the uh, stories of martyrdom and persecution. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, this is one where Buddy talked about the Japanese Christians yeah. that were buried to their neck, yeah, and then basically drowned because they wouldn't recant their faith. And, yeah. You know, it's just weird. It is just so weird for me. Like how this happens. Like, I don't know what comes through a person's head to be like, you have to renounce your faith in order to live. Like, how can you be that angry about things in life? Yeah. Um, and then how, why, why do you become so passionate that, that you do it? I mean, these are the things. Anyway. Yeah. Um, another excellent story. It is. Um, and again, it's just, I think it's another place that we can point out throughout this whole quarter that makes me think personally. Yeah. About where am I at? Where am I at? How am I fulfilling what Christ has called me to? How am I walking that out? And that I really do not face the persecution like my brothers and sisters do across the globe. I would point not out. The same way. No, that's, that's true. I would point to So true. I would point out the other thing is when Bob is talking about his experience, he says on page 62, top of page 62, my first response was a period of confusion and reflection. I think that's normal. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a normal thing. Uh, and then go down uh, about middle way that paragraph. However, God chose not to be ignored. Mm. And then one of the things that tipped him over the scale was he had the uh, CP magazine and in the title, the headline was the effort to recruit a missionary for Columbia goes unanswered. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's times where you, you know, you're not looking for, you're not doing the Gideon thing where you've got this fleece blanket out, but I do, I have, I ain't yeah. scared if he can, if it's good enough for Gideon, it's right. good enough right. for me. And there's a sense <laughs> in which, um, God's call can come in a lot of ways and, yeah. and like in, in communion with God, you might say, okay, Lord, I'm not exactly sure where you want me. I've got this. Let's work this out. Let's mm-hmm. see. Let's see if God is in charge of history. Then I, I like to, well, if this happens and this happens, I'm going to take that as a good sure. sign that this is where I need to go. But if it doesn't happen, sure. well, then I'm not supposed to be there. right? Yep, absolutely. So so another, we're just going to end this little section here with a couple of questions. And that's, are you feeling called? You know, is, is God speaking to you in this moment? Please don't be afraid to reach out and ask for prayer for discernment. 
Um, ask your friends, ask your church family to help you discern, and don't be afraid to reach out to um, the director of the missions ministry team to help discern that call as well. Yeah, if you're talking about missions, that yeah. reflection question, mm -hmm. go with that. Because, sure. Okay, right. so the reflection question that we have in the beginning of the Digging Deeper section says, does every Christian have a call of one kind or another? How would you compare the call of Paul to travel away from Israel to share the gospel with your own call to minister in your own your community? And is a Christian calling really a series of one call after another by God with interludes in between? What do you think? So first, does every Christian have a call of one kind or another? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Maybe a vocation. And so I think that's a calling. And so when I when I said, I mean, you might not, during these encounter studies, you may not be called to the missionary field, but right. you might be like me and say, gosh, people are taking this more serious than I am. Maybe I do need to think about what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's where you talk to your pastor. Yep. You talk to your Sunday school teacher, talk to, you know, elders in your church and say, I need to be doing more. But I'm not yeah. clear what, and that's that's what we were talking about. But it's yeah. not just a missionary; you're called to do something. Yes, yeah. Uh, and don't, don't we're shy all away from that. parts of one body working together. How would you compare the call of Paul to travel away from Israel to share the gospel with your own call to minister in your community? I mean, like when I remember when I was 18, I moved out of my house and I moved like a mile, 1.8 miles away from my parents. But 1.8 miles, if you do it right, is 800 miles, <laughs> right? Like. It's an attitude. Sure. Right? Sure. And so, um, you know, I say it's not the attitude is like if you're genuinely giving up your comforts in your church to serve your community, mm -hmm. it's going to feel like a long journey mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, this is a place where you like red carpet. And if somebody wants to even mention changing blue, the color, blue then, then you're going to have a fight. So, yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is an attitude, the attitude of a focus, fo outward focus is just a hundred miles, yeah. thousands of miles away from the inward focus. Yep. Even though you haven't actually gone anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Um, is Christian calling really a series of one, one call, call after, after another? another? With interludes in between? Yeah, maybe. I don't I know. Mean, I don't know. Yeah. That's... It depends on whenever God wants to stop and start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a really good, that's a really good thought process. Because for me, my experience so far has been one call after another, call after another, call after another, call. Nothing was, in between? Um. No, it's really, I've just kind of went from one calling to another. Like, I feel like whatever yeah, the I'm purpose right. was that God had me at was fulfilled and completed in that spot. And then he moved me to something else. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dig deeper. So what else you got in digging deeper section? Um, I do like the question of, the, mm -hmm. did you receive the Holy Spirit? Uh, I don't it sounds terrible. There's an old, I forgot what book it was. I don't know if it's Tom Rainer book or if it's like a Lyle Schaller book. I don't know. It's Leonard Sweet, one of them. It's like, um, if the Holy Spirit withdrew from your church, would you know it? Ooh. Or would your community know it? Sure. Sure. And I feel like that was a Tom Rainer book. It could have been. I don't know. I feel like I've read that one too. I just remember thinking, not sure. I Ooh. don't know. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I, it would not surprise, like, okay, I'm, you know, I, I don't, I don't dig and I don't flourish in right. the Pentecostal system. Sure. Church system. Sure. But I've never, 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 never criticized them. Because, like, I read in Scripture what this Holy Spirit did, miraculous things. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like I can say, well, that never happened. And I don't see the argument where, like, the Holy Spirit now just can't do the same thing. But I, I mean, I can, I can, I can say I've been in churches and I've, I've met Christians where I would want to ask, be like, "Hello, yeah, there's the spirit in you, hello, yeah, are you there?" Yeah. And so, um, anyway, that makes me chuckle. Um, so maybe we're just not doing it right. Maybe we need to. I don't know. I, I don't know. But that's that's what I feel initially when I read that. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question to ponder. Now that you have me thinking about that, I think I've been in churches, I've been in uh, places of worship where the spirit was definitely very strong. Like I could feel the spirit moving in that building. And I have been in places of worship where I just, there was nothing. Yeah. I didn't feel anything there. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the Holy mm. Spirit there. The other thing that we bring up in this passage is, is that there was some sense to baptisms. Now we don't mm -hmm. practice that. No. Um, historically, but I mean, there is a fight where, well, okay, you're baptized, but then have you been baptized by the spirit? Again? Yes. This is a Pentecostal yep. Thing. Yep. 
Um, and in this sense, there was at least two baptisms because so have you been baptized? Well, we got baptized with John. Well, mm-hmm. we need to baptize you in the name of Jesus. Um, and so there has to be something a little different there. Now, I don't think the church ever baptizes in the name of John. Right. Um, but we do think, like I said, there is a thought, is, is there a second baptism of the Holy Spirit? We don't think so in the Carmel Presbyterian Church. Right. We think that when you're you, baptized, you, when you baptize, the Holy Spirit comes. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So, that's all I got in that. Okay. Well, then let's learn from the scripture a little bit. So okay. he continues on from um, the same question, really talking about, no, we have we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Yeah. Which we're going to give them a pass because... Um, they're Gentiles. Right. And this is still brand new. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they weren't part of what happened at Pentecost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, but there's no excuse for us in the church not to at least have heard about the good works of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Um, so there's that. Um, so he kept preaching. He yeah. was, yeah, Paul is still preaching, still talking to the people, trying to help them understand. Um, and then they ask a lot of questions. Um, and this, this Paul, this Paul, Bob brings up, he brings up these questions. Um, are we spending too much time in the church or do we need different evangelistic and discipleship strategies for different locations and audiences? What do you think? Yeah. Like I said, again, that's the difference between an inward focused church and an outward focused church. Right. If your church is, you know, the church is a building, but it's a sent people, right? We're an apostolic church. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and those methods are going to change every generation or so. And sure. Every time somebody else moves into the community, it's a different community than it was right. before they moved in. And so um, I think basically what we're saying, maybe the Holy Spirit, that's maybe what the Holy Spirit does. It convicts you of your sin, this internal um, consciousness. And, but then it also forces us outwards to say, you know, you're not a... You're not a dam to hold the waters of blessing to the world. Mm, You're supposed to mm. open up and let the let the river flow, so to speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that uh, that helps. Mm-hmm. Um, here's another question: uh, Did Paul have access to any scrolls outside of the synagogue? Or was Paul preaching heavy on theology, since much of his theology was really put into writing while in prison? Well, um, was Paul's teaching focused on the personal impact of those who walked with or been influenced by Jesus? Uh, how heavily did the did Paul depend on his Damascus Road experience? I don't, I don't know. Like, we don't have... He recounts a couple personal testimonies. Sure. But he doesn't bring it up that often. No. He just says, I was blind, you know, or yep. I became a... You know, and I went to Arabia. He does talk a lot about personal experience. But, I, I, you know, I think Paul was probably formulating everything mm-hmm. while he was preaching or whatnot. Oh, I'm sure. And it's not like he had to make it up. He was grounded in the Old Testament. Yeah, very. In the theology of the yeah, Old Testament. Yeah, again, very well educated. And so I think maybe he wasn't just, you know, he was preaching the Old Testament. So I'd mm-hmm. say he was preaching his Bible mm-hmm. just like we would. Right. And then while he was in prison and not getting, you know, stones thrown at him or people trying right. to kill him, he had time to really reflect, put some things. Think in. about that theology and what yeah. that meant and how how to interpret the prophecies from the Old Testament in light of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. How? Yeah. how um, and then how does that work? What does it mean? Yeah. That's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. What does it mean that the Holy Spirit lives in your life? So that's what, yeah. when Paul taught, how did he explain the role of the Holy Spirit in one spiritual life? Well, we know from the letters that the Spirit cr- helps create the new man. You put off the old, you put on the new, yeah. you, you live by the fruits of the Spirit. You live by faith. And when you do that, the fruits of the Spirit are peace, patience, joy, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and all these things. Mm-hmm. It's not being terrible. Right, right. And so um, there's that. That's all I got. On okay, that. well, let's hit our discussion question. It says, let's not get bogged down in the endless and useless discussion about the method of baptism. Wouldn't it be better to win one person to Christ and spend hours in Sunday school bickering over the proper mode of baptism? Instead, ask yourself, have I tried to develop a place and a method to discuss faith outside the local church? Where is it and how are you doing it? And when I read this, the person that I thought of was Reverend Bobby Sperling. Bobby! Amazing uh, gentleman down in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Um, he posts just about every week. There's a local coffee shop that he frequents. And on his Facebook page, he'll post just a picture of the scripture and his coffee. And he'll say, you know, I'm here from this time to this time. I'm here to 
have questions about faith or anything else. And it's a way for him to get outside of the church and just meet people of the community. And whether they're talking about Jesus or whether you're talking about the latest basketball game, just developing relationships. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing yeah. to be able to, because like you said, I think it was in our last lesson um, that sometimes we get stuck in inside of the walls mm -hmm. and we don't engage people outside of the walls. I bet that changes the way the sermons have gone. Sure. I'd like to ask him about it. So, I mean, so that's an example. Another example would be like uh, one of the pastors at the Margaret Hank Church. I forgot which one it was, but did a lot of golfing. Lots and lots and lots of golfing. Okay. Um, and I always thought, how do, how do pastors have this much time to golf? Yeah. I get to play like twice a year. Maybe. But that was also the the time of the Margaret Hank Church when it grew the most. And he used that. Uh, one of my elders said it was the most amazing thing. He would go out and golf three or four days a week, and then we'd have six or seven couples visit the church the next Sunday. Wow. And it's just he met people, and he used that time as a time to, to the share church. The gospel. Here's talk about Jesus, you know, like talk about people's marriages. if they need. I mean, it was kind of his sure. office outside of the office. Um, not bad. No. But, I no. mean, so everybody's got their own little thing. But the, perp the point is, is that you have that outward method or that outward yep. thought. Absolutely. That you're, you're putting yourself in a position to meet people. Yeah. So it's a great question for you guys. You know, if you're meeting in your Sunday school class inside of the church, do you guys ever consider having dinner together outside of the church? Or, you know, how is it that you're going to meet people in your community? What ways can you do, reach outside of just your four walls? So let's apply the scripture. Let's do our best. So we're the Hall of Tyrannus. He says it's only mentioned once in Acts, but it may be the most important location for the spread of the gospel in Ephesus and all of Asia Minor. Yeah. And so like the pattern before was Paul goes to the synagogue, gets kicked out of the synagogue, I guess yeah. preaches on the street. Sure. This time he's like, no, let's do the marketplace. Yeah. Let's be front and center to where people can come and engage. And so... Um, Bob writes, the strategy is a monumental shift from his previous work in the synagogues. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to take a look at this new strategy. Yeah. Know? And so this new strategy, Bob points out, we have eight eight different points. So the first one is he moved his point of contact to a secular location. So what we just talked about. Yep. Bobby in his coffee shop, Pastor Margaret Hank at the golf course. Yep, They're absolutely. Saying, we're going to we're gonna be in people. Yep. And then he dedicated considerable time daily to teaching at the same location. So you said the Margaret Hank pastor was at the golf course, what, three to four days a week? Yep. Bobby has been very regular at this coffee shop at least once a week. Yep. And so, like, you know, so there's the sense in which um, there's a pattern, right, mm -hmm. that you're going to keep. Some uh, consistency that you're not just going to pop in somebody's life and then disappear the next. Number three, he probably used the Socratic method to reach the Greeks and the pagans. Um now, again, that's going to change a lot. Sure. It might be for Bobby, if he's at a coffee shop and somebody's going through a tough marriage, they'd probably be like, let's go step by step here. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're counseling. And then the counseling becomes a, a way to preach a gospel. Or mm -hmm. at the golf course, you might just be having a fun time and you just get in a conversation. It might not be this. Um, Paul was doing it a little different. He was, renting, basically, he was renting out a place to talk about Jesus. But yeah. with that, this isn't going to happen. I mean, you're not going to call up your local theater and be like, hey, from 8 o'clock to 10 on Tuesday mornings, I need to, I need your auditorium. Right. Exactly. So it's just a little different. The next point is the strategy um, was, was awesome. awesome because it limited the time he spent traveling. And that is, that, <sighs> that is really hard. You would be, you wouldn't be surprised. Before COVID, y'all somebody in your class has experienced this um 20 eight hours a week 10 hours a week if not more was spent traveling mm. you still had to get the same amount done then COVID happened and then you never traveled it filled up still mm -hmm. but you were able to get more done um and so in some sense it's a blessing in some sense it's a curse but point mm -hmm. being is is that there's time that's now being used directly for the preaching of the gospel but you know yeah. it's not like i mean going yeah. like going to walmart takes us two or three minutes like if they were going to a town two or three miles down the road right could have taken a day sure. just depending on the you know conditions and yep so absolutely yeah. so for paul not to have to travel allowed him more opportunity to share the share the message the next point is paul had no new testament to use as a text 
Yeah. But, but that's true. He did not have. Um, he had examples. He had examples of transformation. But yeah. again, like anytime you, like if you read any of the old or the Pauline epistles, or if you hear all of his sermons and acts, unless he's talking to a group of Gentiles who have no knowledge mm -hmm. of Judaism, he's anchoring everything to that Old Testament. Yes. And so I think that's important. To point yep. Out. Yep. Sixth point. We don't know how much time Paul spent working to sustain himself. Now we do know that Paul was a tent maker. Right. Here, this is yeah, part of it. So that he was working to make sure that he had money so that he wasn't relying upon the churches and the charity of others. And he makes that a point. Yes, Just in he case does. anybody would say, well, you're just one of those crazy faith healers that come around wanting money. He's like, yep. look, I worked hard among y'all. You know I didn't take anything from yep. you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, his next point is Paul located himself near one of the major Roman highways. Okay, a few we are averse to this in the Carmel Approach Junior <laughs> Church. We're like, we need We're at least two farms, four cows, and three ducks, and that's the best place for us to <laughs> exactly. build a church. Exactly. If you know history, you know that as Rome expanded, it had an amazing interconnected highway system, and all ro roads led back all to Rome. Roads lead to Rome. Um, so this was a revolutionary way for people to travel just because the Roman highways were so phenomenal. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. Point also being is, is that like Paul didn't just, he, he made himself the center. It yes. was, he was accessible. He made himself, the church can make itself accessible. We talked about maybe, maybe the church needs to have worship service on a Tuesday night because it can yep. reach a certain amount of people. The church made the Paul made himself accessible. Yep. Absolutely. And then finally, Paul had one amazing tool other secular teachers did not have, the Praise Holy God. Spirit. Yeah, that's so important. And yeah. I think that goes back to what we're saying in our preaching. I think the Lord teaches me a lesson. When I write something I know is good, nobody likes it because I can't understand it. <laughs> and then when I write something, I'm like, well, a kindergartner could see this. Everybody's like, it's a good sermon. Yeah, it's a good sermon. And yeah. so, um, and that's the way the Holy Spirit works. Yep. Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, Spirit helps you. lead you, guide you puts words in your mouth when you think, I don't know what to say here, but the Holy Spirit helps. Yeah. So our discussion question for the section says, are you encouraged to break out of your local church routine and try something different to take a spiritual message to the secular world? Is a coffee shop waiting for you? Bobby, continue on. Carry on. Amen. Stay calm and coffee on. That's right. That's right. I think that's a good idea. I mean, like, if you're a pastor who who does stay, well, where could you just go? I have a park. I don't know. Maybe a yeah. park. That might be a little weird. Crazy things happen in yeah. parks. Somewhere, but somewhere public to where yeah. you can. Um, okay, or, last thing. So one of the reasons as to why I like Episcopals or Catholics wear the collar or wear, why nuns wear shirts is because it's a witness in and of itself in the yeah. community that God is here. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think that's not a bad thing for us to do. No, absolutely not. No, I agree. It's a great opportunity for your Sunday school class to think about maybe meeting as a small group somewhere outside of the church uh, other than Sunday morning. How can you be a witness to your community? Done. 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 We finished the quarter, friends. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this quarter. It has been an awesome opportunity to talk about mission. Looking forward to what we're going to talk about next quarter. And we will see you next week with a brand new quarter. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, being gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Bye, everyone.